Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Ford, and we're here for the third in a 70-part series as we as we tackle story by story through. That didn't make any sense at all. The Finca Vigia edition of Ernest Hemingway's short stories. We are going through these one by one, and part three, the third short story in this series, is The Snows of Kilimanjaro. So what we have is a so what happened portion of this video. We have a lit crit portion of this video, and then we have a writer's corner portion of this video. So what happened? Harry and Helen are stranded, and Harry is in a bad way. We end up learning that he has gangrene. Also, his personality is a lot like gangrene. He got stabbed by a thorn in the knee and forgot to put any iodine on it because he's generally a tough guy and he never infects. Um, he and his wife just keep fighting. Fighting and fighting and fighting between themselves, but not like regular type of fights where it's give some, take some, some, he starts some, she starts some, etc. Harry is leading the way every time. It's partially because that's his personality, but also because he is sure that he's dying, and he blames his softening on his wife. And that's why he never wrote all those great stories he needed to write. So, we get some flashbacks to all of those stories that he never wrote. His wife shoots some dinner and brings him to eat and, and begs him, pardon me, to eat some broth. And he gives in and eats some broth between whiskey and sodas, don't you know? Then he convinces her it's time to go to sleep. And he wakes up in time to get loaded onto a plane. No room for her. Sorry, chap, this is the small plane. It's just the two of us, the pilot and Harry. And they take off and head, he and the pilot take off and head to the blunted tip of Kilimanjaro. Just about then, a pesky hyena who has been sticking around makes a creepily human-type noise. It turns out Harry was dreaming. Helen wakes up at the noise. Harry does not. Helen cries his name, noticing his wound is now exposed, but he does not stir, and Helen does not hear him breathing. So, I think the first thing worth looking at here is a note that does not appear in the text that I found online, but is in the Finca Vigia edition. Hemingway left us with this note. I believe this was added by Hemingway. Kilimanjaro is a snow-covered mountain 19,710 feet high, and is said to be the highest mountain in Africa. Its western summit is called Maasai, the house of God. Close to the western summit, there is a dried and frozen carcass of a leopard. No one has explained what the leopard was seeking at that altitude. And you can find pictures of said leopard. But what are we talking about here? Well, Harry dying, I think, is pretty obviously... You're looking at Harry as the leopard. You're looking at Kilimanjaro as your mission in life slash the afterlife. There's a reason we're told that that western tip is called the, uh, the house of God, right? So Harry is dreaming slash dying at the end there and is taken to the house of God. He is the leopard that no one can explain. No one explains what he was doing there. So what are we talking about with the lit crit portion of this story? Well, it's interesting how often this sentiment is found throughout literature. It was strange how easy being tired enough made it. 
We get that sentiment oftentimes when we have first-person narrators who die or when we have very close psychic distances of characters who die, as if dying is simply fading to sleep. But what is wrong with Harry? So, possibly the biggest thing is we keep having come up in these arguments the money, her money. This is a gender role trope. Harry is off put because maybe he's the breadwinner in the relationship. We don't really get any sense of that, but we do get a sense of the fact that Helen is from a much better background than Harry. And no matter what Harry does, he will not live up to the sort of station in life enjoyed by Helen. Helen, uh, that is something... Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Helen is quote-unquote worth more than Harry, and it bothers him. And it's not just that it bothers him, it's that he lets it bother him. So, we get this, she shot very well, this good. She shot very well, this good, this rich bee, this kindly caretaker and destroyer of his talent. Part of the reason that Harry is so nasty is because she is worth more than he is. Part of the reason that Harry is so nasty is that he adopted her lifestyle and he feels that it softened him. Now, this gets this relationship gets a little bit stranger towards the end here. When So, Hemingway is a very big fan of telling us things that he never tells us. He's a very big fan of giving us clues to things that we're supposed to figure out on our own. Right around the time that Harry's dying... They're both asleep. Just then, the hyena stopped whimpering in the night and started to make a strange human almost crying sound. The woman heard it and stirred uneasily. She did not wake. In her dream, she was at the house on Long Island, and it was the night before her daughter's debut. Somehow, her father was there, and he had been very rude. So we are, I think, supposed to take from this that the relationship they have includes a bit of a daddy complex from the rich woman. Now, the rich woman is cited as not being particularly young in the story. I think there's some allusion to her looks having faded, even though she was never, quote unquote, the prettiest. But that does not preclude Harry being older than her. I think this is put in here in order to strengthen that dynamic between them, because if you notice, even in the fights, she will stick up for herself, but she's very subservient. There seems to be a bit of a daddy complex running through the bottom of this story, which would, if that were a dynamic in your relationship, you were the older man to the younger woman, it would add a bit of a strange strain on things if she was the one with the money. You're the daddy figure, but she's the provider. Isn't that weird? So, I think from her standpoint, that is what this story is about. From his standpoint, the story is about the fact that he has been weakened through living an easier life and never deciding to write the stories that are involved in, that, that he relays to us partially in this text, the narrator so kindly. He becomes that leopard at the top of Kilimanjaro 
that was searching for something that no one could explain. He wants to be the great writer, but he has assumed this relationship and it leaves him sort of lost. Sort of lost and stranded to freeze. So, the last thing I really want to talk about in a lit crit portion of this video is just a general sort of feeling that I have on the short story. In my opinion, this is Hemingway's most overrated short story. I, and so part of this, part of this might be because of the things which have become literary tropes in the aftermath of this short story, but I don't know where these things started. There is the whole, oh, it was strange how easy being tired enough made it, sleeping away to death. There is the whole, I feel death coming on, and I am angry, but I will sit here. There is the idea of the partner waking in the middle of the night to find the other dead. There is the idea of the ethereal sounds from nature that awaken someone to another person's death. And again, I don't know exactly how many of these types of cliche type things that are in this story are started by this story and which predate it and feel cliche now. Just overall, I don't think this... First off, I don't like the uh, writers writing about writers thing. It's kind of boring. It's kind of... Uh, I don't know how else to say boring. It's sort of lazy, maybe, from a writer to write about writers writing, right? I don't like, there's the one good part of this short story is that really nasty argument they get to in the Finkavigia edition on 42 and 43. Love is a dunghill, said Harry, and I am the cock that gets on it to crow. If you have to go away, she said, is it absolutely necessary to kill off everything you leave behind? I mean, do you have to take everything away? Do you have to kill do you have to kill your horse and your wife and burn your saddle and armor? Yes, he said. You know, that argument right there, really great dialogue. Really charged argument. Dialogue where you are left to insinuate what is actually going on. Not because the words communicate the actual the actual motivations and the actual emotions but the words communicate what the people in the story are feeling and i think that sentiment is really pervasive for people who suffer that sentiment that i'm going to murder everything if i'm not going to get my way it's just an interesting sort of, it's an interesting thing to look at in this short story. And it's some of the, maybe the best dialogue that we get from Hemingway, which says a lot because Hemingway was really good with dialogue. Now, let's move on to the writer's corner sort of portion of this video. We get this quote. Now he would never write the things that he had saved to write until he knew enough to write them well. Well, he would not have to fail at trying to write them either. Maybe you could never write them, and that was why you put them off and delayed the starting. Well, he would never know now. This is not writing advice coming directly from Ernest Hemingway to you. This is writer advice coming directly from Ernest Hemingway to you. And I think all of us, I have a sweetheart novel. I have a novel that I know I don't have the tools to tell. I have 
many stories that I don't have the tools to actually communicate. I can't put them down. I would fail at them. I have had one of these stories, my sweetheart novel, in my head since I was 20-ish years old. So I'm looking at 18 years now that I've had this novel floating around in my head. Don't have the tools to do it. And I think this is very common for writers. Obviously, it goes back at least to Hemingway. But why? We know the tools that we have. We know the tools that are in our toolbox. We, I think, oftentimes are willing to start stories in which we have no proper investment. But the ones that we really like, we won't start because we don't have the tools. How will we ever build the tools? How will we ever build the tools? There's no Home Depot to go to to pick up the, pi the, the screwdriver that is a romantic interest in a short story. There's no Lowe's that we can go to and pick up a hand truck, which represents what it means to write a 450 page novel. We just have to do them. This is not writing advice from Hemingway. This is writer advice from Hemingway. And we get in this story a little bit more writing, writer, pardon me, advice from Ernest Hemingway. And if you spent any time with me here or on my personal channel, a link to which can be found in the description below, you have heard me talk about philosophy and you probably saw this coming. But in yourself, you said that you would write about these people, about the very rich, and that you were really not of them but a spy in their country, that you would leave it and write of it, for once it would be written by someone who knew what he was writing of. But he would not, but he would never do it. He would never, but he would never do it, because each day of not writing, of comfort, of being that which he despised, dulled his ability and softened his will to work, so that, Finally, he did no work at all. They had made this safari with the minimum of comfort. There was no hardship, but there was no luxury, and he had thought that he could get back into training that way, that in some way he could work the fat off his soul the way a fighter went into the mountains to work and train in order to burn it out of his body. We have an argument for Stoicism here from Ernest Hemingway, who to thunk it? Ernest Hemingway, old Ernie, the man who has the record for drinking mojitos at several bars. The man who I think invented a type of mojito. Leading us down the road of Stoicism here. What are we to do with this? I think. It's true. This is one of the reasons for me that, again, not writing advice, writer advice. One of the reasons that I kind of refuse to do much writing in, on a computer. I do my writing by hand because it is a way to make sure those words were the ones you meant to use. Much slower. You have to, when you write by hand, you have to visualize the same scene that you are telling several times over in order to get it out. Putting it on a computer, it's easy to type those words very much faster. Very difficult to do that by hand, especially if you want to be able to read it later and transcribe it onto a computer. But it also, for me, offers the, the ability to be portably writing. And transcribing it from my words onto the keyboard 
allows me a 1.5 draft of anything that I write. So I write it, and then when I am typing it, I'm editing it slightly in my mind. Here, Hemingway is making the argument not just for that type of dedication in the writing process, but that the writer should be one who struggles, should be one who is not living in bliss, in comfort. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think that one of the secretly, curmudgeonly, as an old man, Lee. One of the one of the things that drives me so crazy about many of the stories that you read today, many TV shows, many movies, etc., is that there's no struggle. And I think a lot of that is because the writers are living in relative comfort. So they're afraid to torture their main characters. When you read someone like George Saunders, for instance, many, most of the struggles that I have read from, so I think in 10th of December, there is but one story, ironically, 10th of December, the last short story in the collection, where there's a real physical struggle. Now, I'm just talking about this off the top of my head, I might be wrong. But most of it, most of the struggle in Saunders is emotional struggle. It's important. How much deeper does emotional struggle go when you give it some embodiment for the reader? When that reader is feeling the protagonist struggle, but is also watching that protagonist suffer, suffer physically. I think there is so much more to a story when that is the case. And then he took it to a whole different level, even in Lincoln, uh, Lincoln in the Bardo characters were dead. Not a whole lot of physical strife there. It's all already been had. So, and George Saunders is one of the best examples that I know of writers today. But there is a quote from Vonnegut in his Eight Rules of Writing where he says, Make your protagonist want something, even if it's just a glass of water, which is passively about this very thing. But I think when we really think about it, it's a lot more of this sort of thing than it appears at the onset. Make your character want something, even if it's a glass of water. Well, if they want a glass of water, why is it? It's because they're parched. It's because they're thirsty. It's because they're dehydrated. It's because they can't speak and they're supposed to be speaking. So they need a glass of water, they think, to sort of wet the pipes. How true is this need of stoicism for a writer? I think it's pretty important I think that when you get into other disciplines, now, actors are not artists. I will stand on that hill and fight on that hill till the day I die. But actors are involved in art. And in as much, they have developed crafts of their own. I think... Writers should do more of that, more of the method acting. I think there should be a heavier emphasis on method writing. To really feel the thing in order to communicate it. It used to be that you quote unquote wrote what you knew. It's hard to do that when you're writing something like fantasy. It's hard to do that when you're writing about, for example, sword fights or whatever. But it's not impossible. You can know the struggle of heft. You can know the struggle of loss. You can know the thrill of victory. 
We just have to translate these things into what it is that we are trying to communicate. But none of that is interesting if we're living a comfortable life. Nobody cares about how comfortable you are. I think I'm going to end it there. That is uh, the third in a 70-part series, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Uh, We will be back next week to take on, is it Old Man at the Bridge, I believe? Yeah, Old Man at the Bridge, and then after that, up in Michigan. If you enjoy or appreciate this sort of thing, hitting the like button really does help me out on the channel as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button because literature is the only thing that I talk about on this channel. And I hope to have you back for the next one.